of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them all. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Verse number 8, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou sh shalt thou serve. Verse number 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Here in Luke chapter number 4, Jesus is going through a time of fasting and prayer. Why is that? He has just been baptized. He's now 30 years old. He has openly revealed himself to the world as the Messiah. There were those close to him who knew that because they had been told that leading up to this point. But at his baptism, it becomes clear to everybody as he steps down into that water, John, who announces who it is that's coming up here, he baptizes him and he brings him back up above the water. And then you have the voice of the Father speaking from the heavens. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You have... Um, the Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove flying down from the sky and landing there upon Jesus. And then, of course, you have the Son there. We have all three of the Trinity present at the same time. And it is revealed to everybody there, this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. And thus begins, in a sense, Jesus' ministry, but not quite yet. Here is the calling in one sense, but now Jesus is going to separate himself for a time. The Bible says that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and being, and being forty days tempted of the devil, in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, ended he afterward hungered. And of course, people ask the questions, wow, you went for forty days without eating? Wow, does this mean he also didn't drink any water? Well, obviously not, because uh, you can only go three days without water before dying. Uh, and to the extent to which he you know, did not eat or anything like that, that's not the important part. It says that he went and fasted in the wilderness. Rather than focusing in on how he did it, the science behind it, or the medicine behind it, that sort of thing, let's focus in on why he did it. Not how he did it, but why he did it. He is getting ready to embark upon his ministry. He understands the gravity of his ministry. He understands what it entails for him personally, what it's going to cost him, but he also understands what it is going to provide, what benefits it will provide for everybody else. And he doesn't enter into it lightly. No doubt before you chose a college or before you chose a career or a path upon which you were going to embark, you spent some time thinking about it. Sometimes people will make snap decisions, you know, on where you're going to go to college or a snap decision maybe on joining the military or a snap decision on uh, asking somebody to marry them because they're about to leave for something for this or that. And so I'm going to hurry up and ask you to marry me and we'll just make the snap decision, you know. And some people, sometimes people do that sort of thing. It's not wise. I wouldn't go about your life making snap decisions. It might be exciting <laughs> and you might pay for some things for a while too after making those kinds of decisions. Typically though, we think about it. And then we pray about it. And then we prepare for it. This is one of the things I'm trying to teach the children that, you know, they get a little bit of money and immediately they start to start to think about what can I spend that money on? Can we go to the store now? 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 Well, what do you want? I don't know. I got some money. 
well, you just, you just want to spend money or you got something specific that you want. Of course, once they start getting specific things they want, usually those things, uh, the cost is in the three digits or four digits, you know. <laughs> once they have something specific they want, it's usually expensive things. Uh, of course, as you get older, your toys get more expensive and cooler at the same time, don't they? Um, but I'm trying to teach them this idea of, you know, don't just feel like you have to go out there and spend money just because you have it on a whim instead. Oh, thank goodness. I've been up here sweating. Uh, instead, you think about it, you prepare. I mean, sometimes I'll want to go out and purchase something and I'll, you know, watch videos and I'll read things online and I'll check out the reviews and I'll take some time, you know, something I, I made a purchase on recently and I've been wanting to get one for years and I've been reading about them and watching videos and trying to decide exactly what I wanted for years before I finally did it. Now, maybe I waited too long, according to some people, or not long enough. Maybe I shouldn't have spent my money on a period. But the point is this. Jesus was getting ready to head into some, some very serious parts of his life, his ministry, and he wasn't going to go into it lightly. He was going to go before the Lord, and he was going to pray about it. He was going to take the time necessary. We ought not embark upon service to the Lord lightly. We ought not embark upon service to the Lord with the mindset of, well, if this doesn't work out, it's no big deal. It's no skin off my back. It's just the church, right? If this doesn't work out, it's just the church. I can always go find another one. Uh, if, I, if I make a few people upset with me, it's no big deal, you know. Uh, and we cannot embark upon serving the Lord with that kind of flippant mindset. But we, in need, we need, instead need to embark upon it with the mindset of, I've only got one life to live. And I've got a one ministry to minister. And I want to please God in that ministry today. Not if I mess this up in six months, I'll go and try again later. I've still got time. But I want to embark upon it and to do it right today. And Jesus embarks upon his ministry and begins it with prayer and fasting. That's a pretty seriousness about how he thinks about his ministry. And let's stop and remember something. He's the Son of God. He is sinless. So he's not going to just go out there and make a foolish decision. He knew from the beginning that this is God's will for him. This was the whole reason he's on this earth. So why then does he need to take time to prepare himself for something that he already knows is what he's supposed to be doing? Jesus, not only does he need to take time to prepare himself for it, he needs to be led by the Spirit in this. We saw that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We've seen already times where he was led by the Spirit. It says, you know, again, in, in verse number one of chapter four, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan. This is, you know, after his baptism, he returns to Jordan and then the spirit leads him out into the wilderness. You know, out in the wilderness, there's not a lot of distractions. I guess there are some mosquitoes. That's a bit of a distraction. Um, a hungering, aching belly. Uh, that's a bit of a distraction. Aching feet because you've been wandering around out in the wilderness, that's a bit of a distraction. The pillows that are made of stone are not really all that comfortable. That's a bit of a distraction. But there's no people. There's not materialism. The hustle bustle of life, you're not around all that when you're out in the wilderness. You're disconnected from the entangling webs of society and other people and relationships why? What is the purpose of that? So that only one relationship comes into focus. Kind of like when you go on your honeymoon. You are, you are removing yourself from friends and family on purpose. Um, because right now you want to put focus on one relationship and one relationship only. Now you may still be around other people. But you're typically, usually, not around other friends and family during that time because you want to focus in on this relationship as this is, biblically now, your first time you know, physically together, your first time to be able to spend not just you know, the physical intimacy, but even the emotional intimacy that you're now getting to share because you don't have to take her back home and drop her back off at her house again. And you don't have to, you know, now you're stuck. 
You know, <laughs> you're together, and now you've got to, uh, to arrange the puzzle pieces so much that you can fit together nicely now. And the, you, I know you thought you had it all together before you got married, right? And you thought you had it all sorted out, and you knew each other, and you were a perfect fit, and then you got married, and you realized, okay, well, there's more to this than what I originally thought. Not... I'm not saying that my marriage went poorly at the very beginning. That's not what I'm insinuating here. What I'm saying is, and you understand this as well as I do, when you embark upon that journey, uh, that road isn't exactly all the time what you thought it was going to be. And then you grow and you adjust, and that's why you separate yourself away from friends and family, family at the beginning. Not just because of which direction the toilet paper rolls or which direction, you know, how you roll your toothpaste tube or something silly, you know, like that, but... Uh, for a whole lot of other things, you've got to remove yourself. And Jesus removes himself apart from society to focus upon one relationship alone. And you might think to yourself, what in the world does he have to focus on? I mean, it's not like he has sin to ask forgiveness for. It's not like he's got, you know, this big career decision that he was hoping to go and be, a, you, know, uh, you know, a fisherman. Or he was hoping to go and be a boat salesman or something. And, uh, and now he's got to wrestle with whether or not to go in the ministry or sell fishing boats, you know. Uh, it wasn't like that at all. But yet it was still important enough for him to separate himself and to fast. Why? Because he's embarking upon something important. He's not going to go take a test to get some sort of a license. That's important too. He's not, you know, getting ready to get married. That's important too. Those are things upon which you, might, you should be praying about too. But he is about to embark upon something extremely important, and that is God's will for his life and his ministry to the world, frankly. You think about the weight that rested upon Jesus' shoulders during that time. And then during that time, the devil takes opportunity to test him. An opportunity to try to derail what God's intended plan for him was. Every single step toward the cross was opposed by Satan. He does not want the people of God to experience spiritual victory. And, and every day we hear of good Christians experiencing trials, trials of faith, physical trials. Sometimes these attacks are brought on by Satan. Sometimes these attacks are brought on by our own flesh and lust. But first Peter, and Peter, Peter describes it in 1 Peter as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is searching searching for Christians, little boys, big boys, girls, moms. He is searching for Christians whom he can relegate as useless. All he has to do, he doesn't have to completely destroy you. He doesn't have to bring you crumbling down in a prison somewhere or homeless somewhere. All he has to do is render you useless to the Lord. Many times it's as simple as... Something shiny over here. It turns your attention and gets your attention over here on this thing. This thing you want to do, this thing you want to spend your time on. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it's a movement. Sometimes it's politics or news. Sometimes it's yourself, health, exercise, wellness. Not, those things aren't necessarily bad, but sometimes it's just a little bit of glitter that gets you headed in the wrong direction, and now your focus is there. Jesus separates himself from all of those things to focus on one relationship alone. Because he was divine, it was impossible for Jesus to sin. However, we watch Jesus get tempted. Sometimes I wonder what's the point of, of him being tempted. If he can't sin, certainly the devil would know that, but the devil's not all-knowing. I remind you of that. We recognize and, and I guess, respect the, the, the devil, you know, his power and, and what he is able to do, but we ought not elevate him to the level of God. He is not eternal, and He is not all-powerful, and He is not all-knowing, and He cannot be in all places at one time. In Hebrews 2.18 it says, for in, for in that He Himself hath suffered temptation, He, Jesus, is able to succor them, or help and encourage them that are tempted. Jesus also went through temptations, and He went through them at the hands of the devil. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever been tempted at the hands of the devil. But he did. He made it through it. Maybe, in he, maybe here we see God the Father's testing Jesus to show that he could be enticed to evil but withstand it. And therefore, hey, it opens up my eyes to how you and I 
can withstand those temptations too. Let's look here at the approach, the approach of the tempter. The approach of the tempter. Okay, we already read here he was out in the wilderness. He was out there for 40 days being tempted of the devil. He didn't eat anything. And when they ended, he was very hungry. So Satan tempted Jesus, just like he tempts many today. Thomas Brooks said this, temptation is bait on the hook. You see, the hook's not temptation. Temptation's the bait. It's the part that slimy and wiggles and moves around and makes you think, ooh, there's a yummy meal there. Well, at least if you're a bass, you know, you think, hmm, there's a yummy meal there. The temptation is that bait on the hook, that thing that gets your heart pumping, that thing that gets you excited, that thing that you know is forbidden, the thing you want. Frances Rowland, she wrote of her three-year-old grandson's insight about temptation. Listen to this story. In Sunday school, the teacher talked about creation and the terrible decision to eat the forbidden fruit. When she concluded the history lesson from Scripture, she asked the children why God didn't want Adam and Eve to eat from that tree. Her grandson shouted, because there is a snake in that tree. Yes and no. The fact is, in every tree of temptation, there is a snake, a poisonous snake. In every tree of temptation, behind every wonderful looking bait, is a hook. And while you may escape the hook time and time again, the hook will eventually get you, and probably already has. There was the temptation of the flesh. Look in verses 2 and 3, where... Um, He's hungry, and Satan says to him, well, you're hungry. I mean, you're God, so just say to these stones to be bread. I mean, you could have the best bread in the whole entire world, better than any man has ever made, and all you got to do is think it, speak it, snap your fingers, whatever. You're hungry, just do it. And so he tempts him of the flesh after 40 days of fasting. I mean, I remember going out um, into the Gulf of Mexico with a couple other guys down in Florida, and we... Uh, camped out on uh, a key, one of the key islands out there. It was called Tiger Key. And uh, we were out there all by ourselves, and we kayaked out to the island. It took us almost four hours, I think, to get out there uh, to the first one from Everglade City. It took us only an hour and a half to get back because we timed it right with the, uh, with the tides, you know, coming back in that time. And so it took a whole lot less paddling to get back in. But it was not nearly as enjoyable out there on that natural beach as I thought it was going to be. Setting up a tent out there and camping and fishing, and I thought it was just going to be great and relaxing, and I had these great pictures and images in my mind of how amazing it was going to be, and it was not a single one of those things. Natural beaches are no fun, let me tell you. Uh, You cannot take your shoes off and and wiggle your toes around in the sand, because if you do, you're going to get sand spurs in them, and there's red ant hills all over the place and broken seashells. And we got there right after the horseshoe crabs had come up and laid their horseshoe crab eggs or whatever they do and died. So there was dead horseshoe crabs all over the place. And there was these tiny little translucent baby horseshoe crabs. Uh, they were real small and you could see right through them and they were all over the place and you'd step on them and didn't even know it. Uh, let me just say this, there was just nowhere out there that you could safely step. There was about 100 yards of shoe-sucking mud from where we pulled up onto where the, where the tide was low. So we pulled up to where the, the low tide was, and then where the actual sand was was about 100 yards or 150 yards that way. And so we had to drag our boats through this mud that was about knee-deep all the way up to the, where the sandy shore was uh, to be able to get there and set up our tents and stuff. And it was just not a very pleasant experience. Of course, there was the mosquitoes and the sand, uh, the sand fleas the noceums, some people have different names for them, uh, that could fit through the netting in my tent and just ate us alive all, ne- all night long. Um, there was, it was not a very pleasant experience. I'll, just, I'll, I'll suffice it to say that. Let me tell you something, though. We were paddling back home, and it was a much shorter trip. It was only an hour and a half because we got timed the tide just right. And we loaded up you know, everything back into the car, and there was a Mom and Pop's burger joint there in Everglades City, the only restaurant in the place, I think. And we were so excited to sit down after three days, you know, out on the, the, this island eating sandy everything, because no matter what you try to eat, sand gets in it. Uh, 
and have a burger and fries, and I wanted a sweet tea like nothing else. Oh, it was glorious. Now, I hadn't starved myself for three days. Imagine having been out in the wilderness without all the amenities that we get to bring with us these days, having fasted this whole time, and now the thought of a big juicy steak, or I don't know what Jesus was dreaming about when, you know, as he was sitting there thinking what made his mouth water, it probably wasn't cinnamon rolls, uh, whatever it was, or even sweet tea. I imagine there was something that, man, he would have just, he would have just loved to have had right then and there. And boy, isn't it crazy how Satan knew it. I guess it's obvious. He'd been fasting. And he picked a weak moment to tempt him with the thing at that moment he was weak in. Jesus could have very easily said, well, you know what? I mean, it has been a while since I've eaten. And I do have the power to make bread appear right then and there. It is within my power, and technically, I mean, it's not like I'm murdering or stealing anything. I mean, it's not like it's really that bad what I'm doing. He could have just done it right then and there. But what was really going on? In the suggestion here that Jesus turned stones into bread, Satan was questioning the Father's love and provision. Jesus could have done it. And sometimes we wonder, well, what was so wrong with that? Jesus would have been using his power to take care of himself. This is not allowing the Lord to provide. This is not allowing the Lord to give him his needs. And Satan is often going to attack us in similar times where we are weak. And we're going to be tempted to cut corners in order to satiate ourselves. Mark 14, 38 says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Where are you weak? What are some areas where it's, you are easily tempted and are more likely to give in? I don't know where those things are for you. I know what they are for me. You know what they are for you. Areas where you're weak and are more likely to give in, maybe it's areas of anger and frustration. Maybe it's areas of lying and bitterness. Maybe it's other areas where you're, you're just particularly weak. Hey, understand this. If that's an area that you are weak, what do you think you should do about it? All right, well, pause a second, and, and let's, let's turn and think about it in a more physical sense, and maybe that'll give us a good understanding. Let's, let's uh, suppose for a second that you have a physical weakness. It's a wound that you have received. You're getting ready to uh, go out and go on a, a wilderness hike, or maybe you're getting ready to go out onto the football field or the soccer field, and you've got a wound, something that it's not bad enough to keep you from going out and playing, but you don't want to make it any worse either. So what do you do? Any ideas? What, what do quarterbacks do if they have a bad knee when they get ready to go out and play? They wrap it, they tape it up. They, sometimes they may even change some of their mechanisms so they're, they're not putting as much weight on that knee. Uh, the, the linemen, the offensive linemen are going to be aware, hey, he cannot take another hit to that knee or we may lose him for the rest of the season. And so they have to try a little bit harder to keep people off his back uh, so that he doesn't get tackled. He is going to protect his weakness. Why? Because he's aware of that. It still aches. It still hurts him. It's in the back of his mind all the time. I mean, I have a bad back, and so it's always in the back of my mind all the time. Every time I bend over to pick up something, this could be the time it snaps and I end up on my face, you know. Uh, and it's, I'm always thinking about that because it's a weakness of mine. Chocolate cake is another weakness, but we don't need to focus on that one. <laughs> but that one's a weakness. When you have a weakness, you have a tendency to protect that weakness. You wrap it, you bind it up, you put salve on it, you keep others from touching it, you keep any other dangers from making its way to that weakness. So if you have a spiritual weakness, whatever it is for you, you have this weakness, something where you're tempted, and it's just so easy for you to give in to this line of thinking, or to give in to saying these words, to give in to frustration, or bitterness, or anger, or any other number of things, to greed, lust of different kinds, pride even, you know that that's one of your weaknesses, 
So then you must protect it. Not because you don't want the Lord to heal it, but you must be aware that it's always there. And at any time, it could bring you down. When we pretend that it does not exist, when we pretend like it's not a big deal, that is when damage happens. That is when destruction comes. Someone said this, if Satan would tempt Jesus with his identity, he will tempt you regarding your identity as well. When we get to verses 5 and 7, he tempts Jesus with his identity. In verses 5 through 7, we see a temptation of ambition. Why did Jesus come? To save and seek the lost, or to seek and to save the lost. That mission could only be accomplished by him hanging on that cross and shedding his blood. That's not much to look forward to. But imagine for a second, man, what if I could still do the same thing, bring about a better world by compromising God's will of me dying on that cross and going through all of that humility and pain and stuff. But what if, what if I could become king of this world and then, man, I could just really rule with an iron fist. Man, I could, just, I could do all sorts of good if I were to ignore God's will and instead put myself on that throne. Satan is offering him that opportunity here. Of course, it kind of seems odd because, after all, the world is his, right? Jesus created it all anyways. But Satan has been given some latitude here on this earth. He goes to and fro. He, uh, he is the prince of this world for this time. And God and the Son, Jesus Christ, have allowed Satan to be the prince of this world for the time. And so in one sense, he kind of rules during this time. Satan brings uh, Jesus up to a high mountain, and he shows him at one time all the kingdoms of the world. I knew a person one time that said, you see, this is why I, I just can't really believe the Bible. There's no mountain tall enough you can see the whole world from it. It's like, really, that's the part you're stuck on? You know, <laughs> As if, I mean, I mean what, what, did they walk there? Or do you believe that Satan, you know, had a jeep? Or did he fly? Or did they just appear there? I mean, obviously there's something supernatural going on here. I don't think that's really a sticking point. Which mountain it was, how high it was, could he really see the kingdoms of the world? Did he show him on a, a you know, a LCD screen? Or did he just show him the land all around about him and he could see several cities from there? He says, listen, you see all this? I'll give it to you and more. All of it. I will let you rule and reign. All you have to do, Jesus, is bow down to me. How tempting would it have been for him to say, well, I really don't like the idea of, of the cross and all of that stuff. Just imagine how much good I could do if I became the ruler of the world. Man, I could take all the murderers and with his supernatural knowledge, man, I could just end all of the murderers and all the rapists, and man, I could just, I could make really good laws and we could have justice, true, real, God-like justice here. Man, I could do so much good. Would that solve the problems of this world, though? Absolutely not, because there is none good but God. And mankind can never be righteous, especially if Jesus had not died on that cross and shed his blood to become our righteousness. Then mankind would never have a hope to be righteous ever again if he had not submitted himself to the will of God. And so Satan is tempting him here. A temptation of ambition. But then we also see a temptation of pride and sensationalism in verse number 9. Satan failed in his first two attempts, and so he takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple. It's about 70 feet above the Kidron Valley. And he tempted Jesus to show his power. Jesus, step off the top of the tower. Step off the temple. They look down, and of course some of you might get woozy and fall <laughs> just from looking down and from a high height. Heights don't, you, don't really bother me much. I like you know, heights, that sort of thing. He says, step off here. Well, why? Well, he quotes Old Testament scripture here in these verses, and he says, well, it, you know, God's not going to let you die. It's not time for you to die. He's going to take care of you. So why don't you prove to all these people here that you're truly the Messiah? Because when they see 
you falling from the pinnacle of this temple and they see angels swoop in and grab you and you stop from hitting the ground like two feet above the ground and everybody stops and goes <gasps> and look and <clears throat> there you are hovering two feet above the ground and there's angels underneath of you. They're going to be like, wow, this is amazing. He must be the Messiah. So here's a chance for you to show off, Jesus. Here's a chance for you to show everybody who you are. Never mind the fact that he'd actually already done that when he got baptized, and God the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. So there's the temptation of pride and sensationalism. Listen to what Spurgeon says. He says, be not proud of race, place, face, or grace. I like that. Be not proud of race, place, face, or grace. God's way of redemption was not sensationalism. God's method of redemption was not for it to be scattered across the sky in fireworks, but upon the despicable cross. It wasn't glorious to be hung on the cross. It wasn't a sign of martyrdom. It wasn't a sign of glory. It wasn't anything that anybody looked up to or wanted to be done. That's not something that would happen to gods or good people or, or beloved people. They didn't get hung on crosses. It was for despicable people. We think of, of the execution chamber, the gas chamber, the injections. When we think about that, we're not thinking of, of good people. We're not thinking of glorious people. We're not thinking of respectable people. We're thinking the exact opposite of that. It's shameful to have to be in that place. There was no sensationalism about God's method of redemption. It wasn't pleasant in any way, shape, or form. Certainly, the Jews would have received him as Messiah if he were rescued by angels. John 3, 14 and 15 say, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. How must Jesus be lifted up? Was this it? Was this it right here? Oh, maybe this is it. Maybe Jesus was tempted to think. Maybe here's an opportunity for me to be lifted up on this temple and to jump off and the angels come in and save me and now everybody believes. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He had to hang on that cross. He had to shed his blood. Christ didn't come merely to stir the emotions, but to speak the truth. And I'll tell you what, I feel like there's a whole lot of Christians who need to hear that sentiment today. Christ did not come to stir the emotions, but to speak the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Oh, he could have wrestled away and says, no, I want it now. I want my kingdom now. I want my bread now. I'm not going to wait for God's provision. I want to be recognized by all and worshipped by all as Messiah now. I want it now. That's what he could have said. This is what Satan was tempting him with, offering him. Now, Jesus was not susceptible to that temptation, but you are and I am. We are susceptible to that kind of temptation. That was some powerful temptation right there as Jesus was preparing to embark upon his ministry. But how did Jesus fight these temptations? In verse 4, in verse 8, in verse 12, we see Jesus use Scripture. He quotes Scripture to battle against the devil. In fact, here he quotes the book of Deuteronomy three different times. This is a good example for us. We're going to face temptation. We are a fallen race. We were born in sin. We have a predilection to sin and to self. And so when we face that temptation, even in our weakest moments, what are some ways of escape? Well, one, Scripture promises us a way of escape. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. By the way, don't get fooled into thinking you're a special case. 
Don't get fooled into thinking that your temptation is too strong for you. It's stronger than what other people have to suffer through. It's worse for me than everybody else. Don't get fooled into thinking about that. That's going to lead you down the road to a pity party and expected failure and destruction. And there's going to be no hope or encouragement in that path. No, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God, I like when there's an injection in Scripture when you hear, but God, because there's always a reason. It's like a break in thought. It's, woe is me, I'm, everything's going wrong, and I don't know what to do, but God! Bam, you know, there's this, ka-chow, the lightning comes down, but God! And he's going to change things right now. But God is faithful. I like that term, faithful. You see, you and I, we do this throughout life. It's highs and lows, and highs and lows, and excitement and discouragement, and excitement and discouragement, and depression, and back up, and, and things are great, and everything's going fine, and God is great, and I love God, and I love being a Christian, and oh, I'm thinking I'm just going to quit church, and I'm going to quit everybody, and I'm going to quit me, and I'm just going to, you know, life is horrible, and God's not... Praise the Lord, God is not riding on that roller coaster, in a sense, with us. He is faithful. He's like this. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? Think that the next time you're suffering temptation. God is monitoring it. And he's checking to make sure. He's watching to make sure that the temptation does not exceed what, he can, what, what I can handle in this temptation. Not my own personal self-handle, but through the power of the Holy Spirit within me to be able to handle this temptation and to walk away from it. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation, are we? When you're in the middle of temptation, the, the escape door can be t- 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide, and it can be lined in flashing lights, and it can say, escape, escape, escape. But you don't want it because you want whatever the temptation is. Yes, he'll make a way of escape. It's going to be there. Now the hard part's going to be, will you choose the way of escape? You see, it's a whole lot easier to choose the way of escape early on in that cycle than it is to choose the way of escape when you've been marinating in the, the temptation for a while or steeping. I'm not hungry, if you can't tell. When, you're, when you've been thinking about it and living in it, and you didn't say no, but you said maybe, or not right now, it gets harder and harder and harder to find that door. Not because the door's gone away, it's just you just don't want it. Until you've given in to the temptation, then immediately you regret it and wish there was a go back button, and there's not. In Psalm 119.10, he says, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thy word have I hid in my heart. We often take that to mean memorization, and that's true. But it's more than just memorization. It is the word of God becoming a part of who we are, not through osmosis or mysticism, but we, we just ingest it. We read it. And while we may not be able to come up with a chapter and a verse, we, we know what the Word of God has to say. We, we know whether or not this is right or this is wrong. We know that the Word of God would be against this by principle because it's been such an integral part of our life. If it's not there, we know. There is a way of escape. They promise a way of escape. They also provide a way of escape. So we see in verse number four, he says, man shall not live by bread alone. Because the key to spiritual life is not through comfort. The key to spiritual victory is not through everything going swimmingly and having no problems. The key to spiritual life is living by the Word of God. The Word of God, not the Word of men. In verse 8, he says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. This one's a little bit more straightforward. You want me to bow down and worship you, Satan? To you and I, it might have been tempting to do that. Oh, I would never bow down to Satan. 
Yeah, but think about this. You're being given an opportunity to rule the whole world. And how many of us have ever thought to ourselves, if I ever became president, then I'd do this, or I'd do that, or I certainly wouldn't do that. I would end Roe versus Wade, or I would end this law right away. Man, I'd sign it out of existence right away. The wall, man, it'd be up within, you know, two months. Or how many of us have thought to ourselves, if I were in charge, this is exactly what would be going on. We think that about the church. We think that about the nation or the state, about our, you know, our company. If I were in charge, you know, I'd be doing it. Boy, we would be tempted that way. Man, if I got to be the ruler of the whole world, imagine how much good I could do, and I'm not even Jesus. Or would it ruin me? Would I end up being more wicked than any ruler that the world has today? Because I would be operating outside of God's will. He says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. In Deuteronomy 6.13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. He also quotes, it says in verse number 12, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is from Deuteronomy 6.16. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Jesus uses scripture here. He uses scripture. Don't go about it your own way. Don't go about it your own way. Don't step outside God's will and see if He's going to, you know, put up the roadblocks for you. You simply do what is right. Don't test God. Don't say, you know what, I'm going to go do my own thing and God, please stop me. Here I go. God, please stop me. Oh, no, you didn't stop me. No, no, no. He told you to walk in truth. You're the one who decided to walk off the cliff. He told you to walk in truth. You're the one who decided to test him. He told you to stay in the middle of the road and to walk in truth. The Word of God, the application of Scripture here, provides a way, it promises and provides a way of escape to us. What else can we gain from this here? Number three, the awareness of the believer. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are aware, and you need to be aware tomorrow morning when you get out of bed and you make your coffee, you need to be aware that, the, that, the, the, that Satan has devices, he has methods and plans and schemes upon which he embarks, and we need to be aware of them. And he desires not solely to just bring us to complete destruction, but again, sometimes it's just to render us useless. But there is victory in the Word of God. Again, in verse number... Verse number four, and Jesus answered, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. There is a victory in the word of God. One of our Baptist distinctives is our belief in the authority of Scripture. That's the A in Baptist, authority of Scripture. But to believe in the, the authority of Scripture and to claim the authority of Scripture are two different things. There is victory in the word of God. Don't make Scripture memory or using Scripture to aid you in temptation as a back burner issue. Oh, maybe I'll try that if, if these other things don't work. No, there is authority in Scripture. This is where I draw my authority from. I don't look at the Bible and then look at what the Baptist in history said and say, well, do they agree? If they agree, then I'll say it. If they don't agree, then I'll go with what the, you know, the other Baptists have said. I don't look to them for approval. I don't look to any other Baptist preachers in the area for approval of my messages. There's other denominations that they do that sort of thing. Their messages get handed down from higher ups. It gets passed down and they all are preaching the same things. And it has to get approved. And if they didn't like something they said, then they have to you know, change the message of what they were going to say. But that's not the way we operate in an independent Baptist church. That's not the way the New Testament church operated either. There is victory in the Word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. There's also victory in a spiritual walk. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. This indicates that he was actively walking with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think, why in the world did Jesus need that? He was Jesus. If he needed it, how much more do I need it? A spiritual walk involves two things. It involves walking in the Spirit and walking in Christian fellowship. With walking in the Spirit, we know Galatians 5.16 where he says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
It doesn't say lust will be gone. It doesn't say the flesh won't be there anymore. But if you are busy walking in the Spirit, hand in hand with God, when the flesh begins to pull you away, you're enjoying this relationship too much to let go and walk away. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But what about walking in Christian fellowship? We need encouragement. We need encouragement for one another. We need admonishment from one another. Sometimes we need somebody to tell us that's not right. You really can't be saying that kind of stuff. We need to do it in humility. We need to do it in the right way with love. But sometimes we still need to do it. We need exhortation. We need others to be exhorting us to do right. Admonishing us from doing wrong, but exhorting us to do the right things. You need to be reading your Bible. You're reading your Bible. You need to be you know, faithful to church. You know, what's keeping you from church? You need to be sharing the gospel with people. What's preventing you from sharing the gospel with people, from being a soul winner? We need each other. Acts 2.42 And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, I'm not all about having tons and tons of programs as a church. There's a lot of big churches around us, even Baptist churches, that have tons and tons and tons of programs. And sometimes people come and visit our church looking for those programs. How's their children's program? How's their young couple's program? How's their teenager's program and their youth program? And, you know, I can't have a youth program if you don't bring your teenagers. I can't have a children's program if you don't bring your kids. I can't have a, a young, young couple's program if I don't have young couples. And, you know, we want to be able to have some of those things, but I'm not about all the programs. Sometimes program ends up taking preeminence over the preaching of the Word of God and actual truth. But it is important that we be together. I'm not going to cancel church so that we can spend some time sitting on the couch talking to each other. But fellowship is important. And we do that. I try to, I try to provide opportunities for the men to get together and to talk about their cars and their guns and whatever it else is they want to talk about, sometimes even politics, you know, but I, I try to provide times for us to spend that time together. One of the problems with spending time together is we begin to learn things we don't like about each other. <laughs> well, that's just natural. That's what's going to happen. Uh, but then we also learn ways in which we can still cooperate and communicate, and we learn how to pray for one another. Uh, that's a part of fellowshipping. That's a part of being brothers and sisters in Christ. We need one another. Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It's his policy to divide us. A healthy church is not a divided church. A healthy church is not a church where there's the crew that likes the pastor and the crew that doesn't, where there's the crew that sits around and talks about this other crew. A healthy church is not a divided church. That is a church that Satan's got his hands in because he desires for the church to be divided because then that makes them useless. In fact, he delights in it. He attaches far more importance to our godly fellowship than we do. Satan knows it. All he's got to do is turn Mrs. So-and-so against Mrs. So-and-so, whether it's for a good reason or not. And then division starts. All he's got to do is to help Mr. Critical be more Mr. Critical. And then division starts. And I speak that person because I'm Mr. Critical. <laughs> And it's very easy for me to be critical, and no doubt it's easy for you to be critical of me. But that's not what he needs from us. We need to be on the same side. And our enemy needs to not be one another, but our enemy needs to be outside these walls. And we need to march together against our enemy. The enemy is the gates of hell, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Spurgeon says, since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. Cause separation among the ranks of the church. There's also victory in submitting to God. When we're submissive to God, we're less submissive to temptation. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. This is humility. I'm giving over myself, my time, my money, my efforts. I'm submitting myself to God. However, resist the devil. 
Submit yourself to God, but resist the devil. And he will flee from you. You can't make God flee from you. God's in all places. He's too power. He won't flee, but he will back off if you continue to resist him. The devil, however, he will flee. He will run from you when you resist him. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Listen to what Benjamin Franklin says here concerning temptation. And this is good. I like it. "'Tis easier to suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follow it. It's easier to suppress that first temptation that arises than it is to try to satisfy all the temptations that follow it once you've given in. Now, maybe you've given in to temptation, and so it's gotten stronger and it's gotten a hold on you. Nevertheless, today, tomorrow, the next day, the temptation will arise yet more. And it's a whole lot easier to suppress that one temptation when it begins, to recognize when it comes, why it comes, to recognize that and battle it right then and there and suppress it because you will never be able to satiate it. It will never be filled. It will never be completely full that you never have to give in to that temptation again. In fact, it's only going to get worse from there. The gaping hole is only going to get wider. It's going to take more to fill it. You're going to have to go further and try harder, and yet it will still never be satisfied. It's easier to suppress the temptation at the first than it is to try to satisfy it down the road. There is victory in resisting Satan. Somebody said, if you want a rotten apple, or if you don't want a rotten apple, I should say, if you don't want a rotten apple, then get out of the devil's orchard. What he means is this. If you don't want to be tempted with certain things, don't be in the places where certain things are going to have the opportunity to tempt you. As I've said before, we cannot always prevent every temptation, but there are a lot of them we can prevent. And too many times we say maybe to temptation when we should have just said, no, absolutely not, I won't do it, I'll turn away, I'm going to stop this cycle of temptation right now because I know it's powerful and I know if I dwell upon it, I know if I let it remain, it may end up getting the, the victory over me and so I'm going to do something to change it, I'm going to get up, I'm going to walk away, I'm going to get my car and drive and do something, I'm going to pick up my phone, I'm going to call somebody, but I'm going to interrupt this cycle of temptation right now before it gets a hold of me. I say no. And there is victory in a walk with Jesus Christ. When temptation comes, we don't focus on the temptation. That's kind of a recipe for disaster right there. You just kind of zoom in and you focus on the temptation, and now it's just every part of your thinking. Instead, we ought to focus on Christ. Hebrews 4.15 and 16 say, For we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help of time of need. When you're in the midst of that temptation, and it's within the first seconds, and you know that it could very easily overcome you, you know how it's overcome you in the past, this is the time to go running, not walking, running into the throne room of God. Don't take a moment and call first or send a letter. You go running into the throne room of God where He is, and you seek His help right that very moment. So from Jesus' temptations, I didn't take a deep dive into the temptations themselves per se, and, but how is it that we can, as Christians can learn from it? Man, he used scripture. We saw how the devil att you know, tempted him. We saw how Jesus used and applied scripture in the midst of those temptations. And then we took some truths from that to be able to apply for ourselves. But victory over temptation begins with the relationship with Jesus Christ. There will be no victory for the lost over temptation. There will be no victory. Jesus came to earth to die for the sins of all man. Only Jesus can forgive sins. Only Jesus can help to overcome temptation. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're fighting a losing battle. That is where it begins. Get saved today. Get it settled. Begin the process of victory. 
Victory over temptation is, poss is only possible through Jesus Christ. If you're already saved, it's important to remember that Jesus also knows what it's like to be saved. I'm sorry, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Jesus also knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows. He's been through it. He was tempted. And being that he was victorious, he can now help you. You know, you've probably faced temptation in your life, right? Once or twice. Maybe you've struggled with some things in the past. Maybe you've been able to achieve certain levels of victory over those things through the power of God. Praise the Lord. Maybe now God can use you. Because you have been given victory. Now maybe God can use you to help somebody else get victory in their life. And you see, it's kind of hard to do that if we don't talk to one another and people don't know the kind of things we're going through. And if they know, hey, you know, this, I struggled with this, but I got victory over it and the Lord has helped me, somebody else may hear that and may say, you know what, could I talk to you about that? Maybe you can help them with their lying. Maybe you can help them with their stealing. Maybe you could help them with their bitter attitude that they have towards their spouse. Maybe you could help them with something else that, you know, they have been struggling with that you also struggle with. That's an opportunity for you to iron sharpen iron. That's an opportunity for you to admonish, but yet exhort and edify, to build up a brother or sister in Christ in an area where they are needed. This, is what the, this was the admonishment for the elder men in the church to help the younger men and the elder women in the church to help the younger women because you've gone through some of those things and now you can help encourage them and bear some of their load to get through some of those things too. Those are just some of the things that we can learn from Jesus' temptation here in the wilderness. Next week we come back in Luke 4, Lord willing, and we will look at uh, Jesus goes on to preach in Galilee. And we'll look here at the very first fledgling steps of Jesus' ministry in Luke 4, beginning of verse 14 next Sunday evening. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for bringing us out this evening, and I thank you for the message, Lord, that you have put into my heart to be able to share with others. I ask that you would help us now as we go home, that we would not forget and just put out of our mind the things that were said tonight. But Lord, I ask that you would perpetuate it in our hearts. Lord, as we face temptations throughout this week, as all of us will, I pray that you would give us the awareness, Lord, of what's causing it, of what's bringing it on, the very fact that we are in the midst of it even. Lord, I pray that you would help us then to go straight to your throne room and to go straight to you in prayer and to seek your help and your aid, that we would interrupt that, that process of temptation right there while it's still easy to interrupt it before we have to try to satiate it, Lord. I pray that you would help us in this way this week, that we would find victory this week in some areas of our life where we've only been experiencing defeat. Lord, I pray for your hand of blessing and guidance and victory upon us throughout this week, your hand of grace upon us throughout this week. Help us to be lights and testimonies for you, Lord. I pray that you would use us to be a light and a testimony, a witness to somebody, even just one person, Lord, this week. Lay them upon our hearts. Help us to be a light and a testimony to them and to share the good news of the word of God and the gospel with them. Lay somebody upon our heart that we could be a spiritual encouragement and help to, that we can pray for, pray with. Lord, I pray that you'd put that upon our hearts and help us to serve others. It's amazing, Lord, how fast our own burdens melt away when we begin to carry somebody else's. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be those burden bearers, that you'd help us to pray and to edify and to encourage, Lord, and to not get so focused upon ourselves. And Lord, I just ask that you give us a good night, a safe trip home, a good week, that you bring us back together again Wednesday evening as we study uh, once more from your word. And I ask all of this in your son's name I pray. Amen.